Imagine yourself poised on a string, arms out, toes curled slightly with the pressure of rope, knees bent, head high. You breathe deeply in and out, finding your gravity. The right foot moves forward, then the left. A deep breath and the jump becomes inevitable as slowly, slowly, your feet find their way into the dance. Open to the first page of the score, and you immediately find all kinds of symbols that are incredibly vague and unexplained. There are eighth notes beamed with wavy lines, arrows for the durations of measures, both vertical and horizontal, pauses marked with angular caps, bars indicating eight to nine, seven to nine. This is a graphic score and should be treated as such. If gestures or markings are not explained, gut feelings should be taken very seriously. Many graphic scores do not detail every little marking, instead trusting that the writing of the composer carries the general feel of the music in its notation. A second glance shows that the violin part is not printed the same in the score. Likewise, the piano cues are different in the violin part. As you glance through the piece, it begins to become abundantly clear that the overall rhythmic structure is the work's driving force. There are many sections where the squiggles or arrows encompass the notation, only to be guided by the number of seconds it must take, or the propulsive meter, which is regularly in multiples of three. Nine, eight, six, eight, three, four. The first appearance of piano notes are harmonics, or overtones, open notes shaped as diamonds. That's all very well and good for a string player, but what does it mean to a pianist? Gubaidulina fills us in. Play on the strings with a tumbler, on the A apostrophe string, thereby producing the first overtone. Keep pedal depressed throughout the section. There are two kinds of glissandi to be produced at right angles to the string and along the string. So not being that well versed in tableware, we proceeded to Google the word tumbler to see exactly what type of glass she meant. Inevitably, what came up was a Batmobile and we very quickly realized that tumbler is a glass of some sort. At any rate, a tumbler was found, harmonics did not want to be produced, no matter the angle, and a wonderful tinny, nervous sound was settled on. The squiggles were articulated with the sound, while hitting, dropping, and moving the tumbler in circles on the piano strings rounded out the full boundary of delivery. Also used was a short slab of wood, as well as scraping fingers along the strings, which created a truly ghostly effect. The genius of this work is that it takes this character, the dancer on a tightrope, and really works with it. The character steps out at the beginning of the piece, hesitant yet sure, testing the rope, bouncing lightly, a warm-up on a wire. The piano and violin take turns in and eventually join forces in the dancer's dance. Becoming more forceful in deliveries, the dancer becoming more confident and vigorous. The climax is the result of 10 minutes of music gradually beginning to propel itself forward, eventually whipping itself into a frenzy. The piano has become the tightrope holding long, full chords over which the violin as dancer, frantic and furious, performs tumbling ricochets exploding with its own excitement until the energy is abruptly lost, echoes of sound still whispering in the air. The piano's last chord hangs as the violin ricochets into pianissimo, as the dancer evaporates into wisps. What became very evident was the work's rhythmic structure. Although speckled with many cadenzas, the rhythm begins to take over the work, and it's the motivating factor in driving it to a climax. Gubaidulina may have given many vague instructions in this piece, but we believe that no matter of ambiguous notation should fall prey to the rhythmic improvisation. If it is unclear which notes to play, the rhythm and meter is regularly precise. 
It is what gives the whole work shape and brings our dancer to life. It is this type of freedom in writing that led to Gubaidulina's blacklisting while living in the Soviet Union. While pushing the boundaries of music, she was eventually forced out of her home and into Germany, where she still lives today. Defying conventions at a time when music was strictly monitored was a dangerous feat for any artist. It is her honesty in writing that sets her apart. We are glad to give life to this music, as it is not played nearly enough. On obtaining the music, it is deceiving. You could very easily be pulled into the glitz of a graphic score. But the depth of the work crystallizes when, while listening, you glimpse a flash of the dancer out of the corner of your eye. <laughs>